Hello, welcome. I'm so pleased to be doing this session on this type of carburetor, the classic sprint type. I realize there's a lot of information on YouTube on how to videos and how to replace and clean these carburetors and how to replace the diaphragms, etc. But what I want to show you is something slightly different, and that is show you actually how the carburetor works. So all the functions of inside and out. I've done similar things, as you've seen probably, with two strokes on my other videos, and I want to do the same with this. I want to show you how it works. This is my understanding of how I've found out over the years. And as you'll see, this type of carburetor functions using a special diaphragm, which is unusual for a four-stroke carburetor. Usually we've got the, the float chamber with the float there and that sort of thing. So this is quite different and I'm, I'll go through now how it works. In principle, it's quite similar to the two strokes, but as I say, this is a four stroke. And what I'm hoping here by showing you how these function is that when you've got that knowledge in your mind of how this carburetor is working, when your machine is, uh, is not working the way it should be, then you'll, you'll be more equipped to dealing with any problems yourself. So you could probably strip this carburetor down and, and you'll know the little nooks and crannies and why it's so vital that we clean these little areas and why it is that we may need to replace the carburetor. And I will be honest with you, me being a repair agent for, for many, many years, I haven't really come across many other mechanics engineers, whatever you want to call them, that actually know how these actually work themselves. So you'll probably know more after watching this video than your local mechanic. OK, so let's get stuck in. Right, so let's just take a better look at this carburetor and we'll bring it into the centre there. And before we go any further, let's just identify a few key areas here so we know what we're looking at. Well, first of all, although I've not shown it here, this is the inlet area of the carburetor, of course, and on top here, there should be an air box there with the air filter in, which isn't shown. But ultimately, this is the air inlet. And this side here is the side that is attached to the engine. And then we've got the primer bulb here. And this is the fuel pickup pipe. And this is the main jet. And then we've got the breather pipe there, which connects the breather from the engine into the inlet there. And then this part here is the throttle lever, which operates the throttle butterfly within. And the main carburetor body here, the whole thing, is made of like a hardened plastic, which again is quite unusual for a carburetor. But at the moment, I'm showing it in an isolated capacity. So let's show it here now. And that's how it should look on the side of the machine. I've only put it in this capacity. I haven't actually shown the engine. I've just shown it how we, when we look at the side of the engine at this carburetor, then it should look something like this. We'll have the air box at the top and the fuel tank at the bottom. And of course, the air box is attached to the top of the carburetor with a single screw. And the carburetor itself is attached to the fuel tank with a series of little screws and that's all attached to the engine. So in order to effectively show you how this carburetor works, I've got to show you the workings of the whole complex here. So what I mean by that is the air filter, carburetor and the fuel tank together. So that complex. So let's imagine now we've got X-ray vision and we can see inside the fuel tank here. And we can still see there where the carburetor is attached to the fuel tank itself and we can see the fuel pickup pipe here protruding down into the fuel here which I've shown in red. Now one thing to quickly notice is if you see the position of the bottom here of this pickup pipe you'll see it's not quite touching the bottom of the fuel tank. That's purposely designed that way so that any crud that weighs heavier than fuel which normally goes to the bottom of the fuel tank if it's quite quite large crud will lie on the bottom of the fuel tank and then the fuel can be picked up a little bit higher than that so that that crud doesn't actually go up into the pickup pipe. Now something very important that I actually haven't shown here yet are these two. We've got a very special gasket and diaphragm that are situated between the carburetor and the fuel tank. And we'll see just how important these are very soon. But for now, let's continue just having a look round. We can see here how the main jet protrudes down into the fuel tank and normally this has got a protective gauze, like a little metal gauze filter type thing. And it looks something like this and it fits on the bottom there. The reason I haven't shown it is just to make things a little clearer. Now at the moment, it looks like the bottom of this carburetor and the main jet and everything is just floating around there and it can't actually pick up any fuel. But of course it does do. And the way it does do is all about the clever shape of the fuel tank itself 
where the carburetor actually sits. So let's take a look at the top of the actual fuel tank and we can see there where the carburetor sits, that special silver area. That face is a nice smooth, specially machined area there that allows the gasket and the diaphragm between the carburetor and the fuel tank to create a seal. So let's see how the carburetor interacts then with this area on the fuel tank. So if we move it across and then we'll bring in the carburetor so the fuel pickup pipe fits down this hole here and the main jet actually fits down into this little area here. It's not actually a hole that goes through the top of the fuel tank and into the fuel as with the fuel pickup. It's actually like a little reservoir there. And so the carburetor is orientated then on top of the fuel tank in this way. And sitting on top of this silver area here between the carburetor and the fuel tank is the diaphragm. And that goes on first and keeps contact then with this nice flat surface. And then the gasket goes on next on top of that. Although these are the original colours, this dark colour for the gasket and the diaphragm. Let's just for the sake of explanation here, just change the colour of the diaphragm and the gasket just so that we can see things a little more clearly to help explain things better. So there we go, we've got the gasket in brown and the diaphragm in green and we can just see things a little clearer now. And that leads me on to saying that it's vital, first of all, that these are put back in when any strip down of any carburettor is done on these machines and also the orientation of the diaphragm and the gasket has got to be right. So the diaphragm has got to go on first onto the fuel tank and then the gasket. You'll be surprised just how many people forget which orientation once they've stripped it down. But it's always the diaphragm that goes on first, then the gasket. The gasket always touches the body of the carburetor there, the plastic body, and the diaphragm always touches the metal of the fuel tank. And it's vital that we get the orientation of these right because if we try and start the machine, if we've orientated these the wrong way round, then even if the engine starts at all, it will run really lumpy and it will bog down. So we've just got to make sure we get this right. And so we can see now then that the way this carburetor works is by using these special holes on top of the fuel tank. So this picture here doesn't actually show that. So what I'll do is I'll just go into an animated version here, a drawing that will hopefully explain things. OK, so there we go. So let's just point out a few key areas here so we know what's what. This, of course, is the carburetor body and underneath it here is the fuel pump area. And I'll be going into that in more detail very shortly. And this is part of the fuel tank itself. But as I say, very shortly, this will become more clear because I'm going into it in detail. And it'll be easier if we make the comparison with a real carburetor. So there we go up the side there. And that, of course, is the primer bulb. This is the breather pipe, the air recycling from the engine. This, of course, is the fuel pickup pipe. And on the end there is like a metal gauze strainer filter that helps also to filter out any dirt and crud. I realise I've already pointed out some of these areas, but I just wanted to be clear on the drawing. So continuing on, this is the main jet here. And that fuel vein in the middle, which is the jet hole, is there. And the removable metal gauze filter that fits over the jet does so there, of course, and that's to help prevent any crud going up into the jet hole, of course, causing any blockages and running problems. In fact, because these are removable, and generally you do remove them to clean them on a service, it's quite easy to forget to put these back in. I've seen quite a few machines that I've worked on where these aren't actually present. So... Whoever's stripped them down before has forgot to put these back in. I've actually known trained engineers to forget to put these back in. The trouble is that you don't really know that they're missing because the engine will run, but it's only when the fuel starts to get dirty that you're going to get problems there with fuel blockage. And of course, that turns into a bigger problem then of trying to unblock the fuel jet. So we'd have to strip the carburetor down again. So it's vital that we try and remember to put these gauze filters back in. So continuing on then, in the drawing here, we've got the gasket at the top and the diaphragm at the bottom, as we explained earlier. OK, moving on to this area now. And I think the best way to explain this area here, because it could be a little complex, is to zoom in so we can have a closer look. And as we've said, the green one's the diaphragm. And at this point here, there's a little valve flap. And this is designed to open and close accordingly to let fuel in or to block fuel. And I'll be going through that very shortly as well. 
So I'll just put that cross-sectional view of the valve flap into perspective with the real diaphragm. So there it is, that's how it looks on the actual diaphragm itself. And this fuel way here, this little fuel vein, is this part here on the actual carburetor, just to put that into perspective as well. One thing worth noting here is that when this valve flap operates, it operates downwards. So it's either up for closed or down for open. And there's another valve flap here in this corner, which operates the other way. So it would be up for open and down for closed. OK, so another very important area of the diaphragm is this centre part here. That's the pump part that just raises up and down. It expands in and out and acts like a pump. And that's actually this part of the diaphragm here. And because of the type of material the diaphragm's made of, it allows this expansion down and up in this way, just in that area. So let's just have a look at what allows for that pump in action. What actually moves the diaphragm downwards in order to create a pump in action? Well, if we could see through the diaphragm, let's just imagine we've got x-ray vision again. We'd see there that there's a spring and that spring is what's forcing down on that diaphragm pushing it downwards, this spring here. And we can see there that the spring is housed in like a compartment up in the card body there. It isn't actually shown on my drawing, so it would be more like this. This would be a bit more realistic. But we can see that the spring would look something like this from a cross-sectional view. Very shortly, I will be going through how the diaphragm actually raises against this spring pressure. But for now, I just want to look into this compartment here, which is where the diaphragm actually expands into. And this is all part of the fuel pump itself. And as I've tried to explain there, anything in blue is part of the carburetor body and anything black is part of the fuel tank body. So that means then that this actual compartment underneath isn't actually anything to do with the carburetor other than the fact that the carburetor uses it. So it is part of how the fuel tank is built and the way it's built, it works complementary to the carburetor. And just to bring that into perspective, if we bring in the fuel tank, we can see there that this cross-sectional view here of this compartment is actually this compartment here. We're looking down on it. OK, so let's move on now and have a look at the primer bulb. Just imagining that this carburetor has never been used before, so there's no fuel in it anywhere. There would be air here behind the primer bulb. So let's just take a look behind there. It would look something like this. We can see that there's just air in there. Those little blue dots I've included there are representing air that's just sitting there, not doing anything, just hanging around. And let's have a look now at what it looks like when we've pressed the primer bulb. So there we are. And immediately you can see by the blue arrows there representing air being pushed or forced out into that little tube there and out from behind the primer bulb. Now you'll notice that there's a hole here as well and some air may well go down here but because this is the path of least resistance if you like, this is the biggest hole, most of the air will go this way. I will be explaining shortly what this hole does. It's basically a primer hole to inject fuel into the carburetor itself. But if we imagine that the fuel takes this route here and it travels down this fuel vein and then when it gets to this crossing point here it tends to take this route downwards. Now I realise by the way I've structured these fuel ways here in this T shape that it looks like the air would keep going and down into the fuel tank. But this is the best way I could structure it to show my point. There would actually be some turns there allowing the air to actually come this way in priority. And therefore most of it reaching the fuel pump area down here. So of course, as I've shown here, as the air comes down out of this pipe here, it actually pushes this valve flap down off its seat, allowing the air to go past it and into the fuel pump area. And just to reiterate, that hole where the air's coming out of there is this hole here on the carburetor. And if we put the diaphragm in place there, we can see the valve flap there that the air has pushed open. So something like this, the air has gently lifted that flap and allowed a flow through. And so now we've got a flow through, that air continues to go down here and it will take this route. But if we look at this first compartment here, we can see that that's part of the fuel tank itself again. It's this area here of the fuel tank. And if you look closely there inside that little compartment on the tank, you'll see a little fuel hole and it goes right through and out here. So that's a constant through road, if you like, and that's this area here. That's these two areas that have animated. So the air travels through this hole 
and it continues on past the fuel pump diaphragm here. Again, this recess here that the fuel pump diaphragm expands into is this area here on the fuel tank. And so the air continues on through another hole here, and that's this hole here, as you can see, and that comes out there. So that's a constant through road as well for the air. And as we can see there, as it does come out of that hole, it lifts the valve flap there off its seat, allowing the air to flow through again. And it flows right round and down this area here that surrounds the main jet on the carb body. This is the area earlier that I explained was a little reservoir here on top of the fuel tank. So just to be clear, this is the main jet that I've drawn. That's this part here on the carburetor. And this area here is that little reservoir I was talking about that the main jet slots into, which is there on the fuel tank. Now, it, just at the side of this reservoir here, there's a little hole and when the engine's running and there's fuel filling this little reservoir, that hole is like a relief area so that if too much fuel goes in there, it can be relieved through that hole that drops back down to the fuel in the fuel tank then. So just to summarise so far, one press of the primer bulb has sent all of that air behind it down, down this fuel way here and down towards the fuel pump diaphragm through the valve flap there and actually into the fuel pump area. And when it gets down here, the pressure of the air might well not allow this diaphragm to sit down like this. It might actually force it up. But the air keeps going and out through the other valve flap here. And then, of course, it travels right round and then it surrounds the main jet here. Any excess when it comes to fuel or air will leave this area here back into the fuel tank. So this is what happens whilst the primer bulb's pressed. Let's have a look at what happens now in there, how the changes occur when we let go of the primer bulb, allowing it to expand backwards. OK, so let's imagine we've let go of it and it's now coming back towards us. Instantly, we can see there's a change there in direction of air. Essentially, what it's done is created a vacuum behind it and it's drawing up here on this fuel feed pipe. And ideally, it would like to draw up from this pipe as well. But as soon as it's doing that, as soon as it tries to draw there, what it does is it pulls that valve flap underneath it up fast on its seat. So we can't draw any air from there. So it can only come from this pipe here. And so that air movement through the fuel vein there to the back of the primer bulb because of that vacuum draws behind it and creates a suction pulling the fuel out of the fuel tank up and filling this fuel pipe here. So we'll come in closer again. That vacuum there because the bulb's expanding outwards is pulling it even further now that fuel and it's all going up into the back there of the primer bulb and it's starting to fill that area. And just quickly, that's why it's vital that these primer bulbs are in good order with, with these types of machines. If there's any, even a tiny little pinprick of a hole in there, we won't be able to create that vacuum to draw that fuel up. And sometimes when people have stored these lawnmowers away with these engines on, these primer bulbs sometimes get bitten by mice in garages etc and little holes appear and sometimes they can degrade over time. That's why we always have to make sure that we always replace these primer bulbs as soon as we see that problem and ensure that there's a seal here on the outer bit so that we don't draw any air in when that bulb expands as otherwise it, th there's no way we can get these machines going. OK, so the primer bulbs now expanded right back out now so it can't expand out any further. And we've got this pipe here now, of course, full of fuel. And it won't fall back down to tank that way because inside the primer bulb, there's still a vacuum there stopping that fuel from going back that way. But it isn't quite full yet, so we'll have to press the primer bulb again. OK, so there we go. We've pressed it. And this time, because there's air and fuel behind this primer bulb, we've got that air and fuel going in together into this fuel pipe here. And again, that's purely because there was both air and fuel already behind the primer bulb and they've been forced out together. That's the only reason. But that pressure from the primer bulb has sent that air and fuel this way. And again, some may go this way down towards the tank. But the majority of all that mixture goes this way down here, down to the diaphragm, through the valve flap here and into the fuel pump area. And of course, the pressure of this mixture coming down here is forcing all of that air in front of it out through these little areas here up through the valve flap and down and out this way so that we've, we can have a constant through road so there's no build up 
OK, so let's now imagine that the primer bulb is right in. We can't push it in any further. So now we must let go and allow it to draw back again. And as it does so this time, it fills the back of the primer bulb because the last time we pressed the primer bulb, we forced out all of the air from behind it. And so now it's expanded. It's pulled that fuel up from the fuel tank up the pickup pipe here and filled the back there. So there's just fuel in the back of the primer bulb now. And what fuel was forced down here on the last press stays down here because this valve flap is forced back up onto its seat because of the suction pressure there. And this, of course, allows for no fuel to go back that way. So let's imagine now that the primer bulb has come right out again, so it can't come out any further. So now we press it again and immediately we can see that the fuel has changed direction again. Now, when the primer bulb's pressed, it takes a greater amount of force to force the fuel out through this little hole than it did when it was air. Now because air is thinner remember it can easily be forced down this little tiny hole here of this fuel hole. The molecules are so small they haven't got to be backed up in order to wait to be forced out if you like. So although there's this hole here as we mentioned earlier because this hole is bigger than this hole then this is the path of least resistance for the air and it was easy to go down this path much easier than it was the smaller hole so that's why it took this route but now there's fuel in there and fuel is much thicker than air and it takes much greater force to force that fuel out of this little hole here then it will look for other routes as well and the pressure will pressurize it through this route here and the fuel leaving this area here is responsible for that extra bit of neat fuel required to start the engine so that's forced straight into the carburetor's inlet where it awaits engine starting. So we know now that some fuel goes this way, but the majority goes this way, and it might well go down to the fuel tank, as I've said, but the majority of the fuel and the way these pipes are designed means it goes this way again. I know I'm going over things again here, but I just want to get this point across properly. And again, the inflow of fuel forces the valve flap off its seat here. Now the pressure of this fuel coming into this area does move the diaphragm up. I know I've illustrated it as up, but it will be down slightly before the pressure comes in and then it will move that diaphragm up. It'll go against the spring there because the fuel can't all get through this area here under the diaphragm quick enough. And so a slight pressure will build up there inside of there, which lifts that diaphragm slightly. But whether the diaphragm's up, down or intermediate, the fuel travels this way and it goes up and pushes the valve flap open there and then flows down there to start to fill the reservoir and surround the main jet here. And of course, as it flows through, all the air that occupied this space is now being pushed out by the fuel through this area here. And what I'm trying to say there is that the fuel's got a constant through road, if you like, to flow into. OK, we've got to that stage again where the primer bulb's right in. We can't push it in any further. So now we let go. And like before, as the bulb expands, it's drawing in fuel behind it and filling it in the usual way. Now, you'd think that the vacuum created by the expansion of the primer bulb would draw the air back this way from out of the inlet of the carburetor. But it doesn't do that because this hole here is also a one way valve. So only starter fuel can go through there, but nothing can come backwards. OK, moving on. So the primer bulb's right back now and it can't come back any further. So now we press it again. And some of the fuel, of course, has gone this way to help start the engine. And most of the fuel has gone this way and took the usual route round and under and round again. And it's filled this area here, which, of course, we know is the reservoir for the main jet. And any excess fuel that comes into this area leaves through this escape hole here and falls back down to join the rest of the fuel in the fuel tank. And so now... When we press the bulb and let go, we know what's happening inside there. So the moral of the story now is we can consider this carburetor primed because we've got fuel up to all of these areas here where it's needed. Now we can look at starting the engine. And just to give an explanation as to why there's a fuel gap here, when the primer bulb's right out and everything's sitting still in there, the fuel that was just above this area here will have fell out down here through the escape hole and gone back down to tank. But that has no bearing whatsoever of the fuel that's in this area. So the fuel that's left down here is then now available for the main jet to use when the engine started. So just for a very quick summary, we press the primer bulb and let go. Fuel comes up this way. And then when that's full, we press the primer bulb again and fuel's forced down this way. And then ultimately the fuel flows into here 
to be available for the main jet for when the engine starts. So that's how the primer system works then on this type of carburettor, but let's have a look now how the carburettor works when the engine's running. Now in order to do that, I'll need to show you a side view of the carburettor. So if we move this one across, and then I'll show this side of the carburettor here, and I'll put that carburettor there. So now we've got the front view that we used to see, in, and then we've got the side view. It's both the same carburettor. And we can see here, this is a cross-sectional view, of course, which will help explain my point. We can see that we've got the inlet coming into the carburettor and through. Then we've got this structure here. This is the restriction in the inlet. We call that the venturi, and we'll see what that does very shortly. And a little bit further on from here, and something that's always near to the venturi, is the top of the main jet here, which we can see extending downwards into the fuel reservoir there. And this is the throttle butterfly here, and that opens and closes like this according to the engine's needs. And then of course we know this is the fuel pump diaphragm. And just above here, inside the carbs inlet, is another channel way. And if you look closely, you can see that it's interconnected with the main jet here via this channel here. And that brings a real benefit and we'll see what that is shortly. And just a little bit further up here, we've got another channel. This is a fuel channel. And as you'll see, this as well brings great benefits to the carburetor. It actually helps in starting and that's this little hole here, as I explained earlier. That fuel goes through and injects into the inlet of the carburetor each time that the primer bulb is pressed. And this extra fuel helps in initiating the starting of the engine. Now the reason I've had to show you two sides to the carburetor is because I've got to use the front here to show you how the fuel pump works and how the fuel gets out to the main jet. And I'm going to use this one on the right hand side here to show you of course how the inlet works and the venturi and how the air is drawn in. And you'll notice I haven't detailed the fuel pump area here on this right hand image because I'm using the left hand image there which is the frontal image which is a better view in order to make the example. And it's this side of the carburetor of course that's actually attached to the engine. So this carburetor now then is all primed up with fuel and it's ready to start. So the operator now reaches down and pulls the starter pull cord. When they did so let's imagine that the piston was at top dead center and it lowered then on the induction stroke and the vacuum then drew in all of this air here into the inlet area of the carburetor. Now it would have come through the air filter of course which I haven't shown but it's coming through the inlet here and as it does so it picks up that fuel there that's lying at the bottom here that was injected in by the fuel primer bulb. Now this isn't a great lot of fuel of course and it's not sufficient to keep the engine going of course because there's only a certain amount but it's just enough there just to start the engine firing once it gets into the engine. But that mixture of air and fuel continues and hits the venturi here and the venturi is that restriction there within the airway and because it's a restriction it creates a higher velocity so there'll be a higher velocity this side of air and fuel coming through of course and it's that high velocity which helps to draw out here, create a vacuum, a high intensity vacuum here that starts to draw up this fuel up the main jet from the main jet's reservoir. And so the air is continually being drawn in towards the engine then with that small amount of injected fuel there. And the vacuum that's built up in here is affecting this little channel also. And just to explain what's going on there, we'll bring this part in. Okay, that's better, we can see now. And this is the channel I'm talking about here, and it extends downwards through the carb body and to the top of the diaphragm here. And because it's a constant throughway here from the induction area here to the top of the diaphragm, then any vacuum felt here in the induction area will be felt here at the top of the diaphragm. To better explain that, let's again imagine we've got X-ray vision and we can see through this diaphragm. And so we can see that channel way there terminating at the top of the diaphragm. And then we've got the spring here, which is pushing down on the diaphragm, keeping it downwards. And so in a nutshell, all that happens here then, that vacuum there that's felt inside this induction area is felt here. And so of course that vacuum has drawn up this channel way as well. That vacuum is also felt here at the diaphragm as well, because what happens is as the vacuum is drawn up that channel way there, it draws on the top of the diaphragm. 
and it sucks the diaphragm upwards against the tension of that spring there. So essentially what's happening there then is that when there's a vacuum in there caused by the induction stroke of the piston, then the diaphragm raises against the pressure of that spring, as I've said. And then on any other stroke other than the induction stroke of the piston, the diaphragm lowers because that spring pushes it back down. And of course it can do this because we're now in the absence of any vacuum. And so as the engine's running, it's just a constant cycle up and down, up and down. And that's why this diaphragm is indeed the fuel pump. And you can see now how that pumping action comes about. So in the bigger picture now of the carbs workings, we can see we've got the vacuum there pulling the diaphragm up. And this fuel pump is the main player in making sure that we've got enough fuel right up and into this reservoir here in order for the main jet to use. But in order to give a better explanation of how this fuel pump directs the fuel in order to be used, I'll just have to zoom in on this point. There we go, that's a little clearer. And what I've tried to show here is that of course the diaphragm's up and that's drawn fuel in underneath it and it's pulled the fuel out of this area here. So it's opened this valve flap off its seat because it, it moves that way, it moves downwards so it can pull that off its seat and it's pulled the fuel in with it. And that vacuum caused by that under here ensured that fuel was only going to come from this way because it couldn't open this valve flap because this valve flap opens the other way, it opens upwards. So what the vacuum has done underneath is it's drawn this valve flap right down fast onto its seat creating a seal and therefore no fuel can possibly come back this way. So in essence, the vacuum from the diaphragm has opened this valve flap and closed that one. Okay, now we've seen what happens when the diaphragm rises and how the fuel comes in. Let's have a look at what happens when the diaphragm comes back down. Okay, and immediately we can see that it's creating a pressure in the fuel both ways, this way and this way. And of course, when the pressure goes this way, it pushes that valve flap, which opens downwards, it pushes it up fast onto its seat, stopping any of the fuel going back this way. And so naturally that pressure has to go somewhere and it goes this way because when it goes this way, it can push this valve flap off its seat because this valve flap opens upwards. And so now we can see how this diaphragm supplies the fuel for the reservoir down here to be used for the main jet. So just with that explanation there then, I'm hoping that we've got a new appreciation of how this diaphragm works and how vital it is that when we've got one of these carburetors that this diaphragm is functioning perfectly. That's why when we take these to a repair centre and we're always told that they need a diaphragm, they're better being changed annually with every service. And even more often than that, if the engine starts to run lumpy or give any sorts of problems. So you can imagine there that if we've got any issues whatsoever with the valve flaps, if they are slightly denatured, torn or damaged in any way, then you're not going to get this through road of fuel properly. You're not going to get them seating properly or opening and closing properly when you need them to. And not least the centre of the valve here that causes the fuel pump to work. If there's any tears in there or slight holes, then they won't create a vacuum behind there and there'll be no pumping action whatsoever. So. I'd always invest the time and money in replacing these diaphragms as often as you possibly can, at least once a year. And in my own personal experience of changing these over many, many years, I have found the genuine product to be the best. I know we could say it's a sales gimmick, a genuine product, but the genuine product, the genuine Briggs and Stratton diaphragm has always worked better for me. I have put non-genuine ones in in the past and had to replace them more often, but that's up to you. I'm just trying to get it so that this engine works the best for you. So there we are, we've got fuel there supplied to the main jet. So in a nutshell, the vacuum there lifts the diaphragm upwards and causes that vacuum and an influx of fuel. And then, and then when the piston's no longer on the induction stroke and there's no vacuum there, we can see the difference. The diaphragm lowers under its natural spring pressure and creates a pressure of fuel going straight through to the main jet. And so now then, now that's been explained, let's see as a whole how the whole carburetor works. And I'll bring in this little indicator here just so that we can see that at each stage of the carburetor's workings, what position the piston's in 
inside the engine to show how the piston affects what's going on inside the carburetor and how the carburetor then in turn allows the piston to operate the way it should do for engine running. Basically how they work for each other holistically. OK, so now let's imagine then that the piston's on the induction stroke and we can see there we've got air coming in because it's being drawn in by the piston lowering and of course that air passes through the Venturi, speeds up in velocity and continues down the induction tube and it's got that small amount of fuel with it that was injected by the primer bulb and that heads off inside the engine to help give an initial start. But as I mentioned earlier, as this high velocity air passes the top of the main jet here, it caused that vacuum and that vacuum drew up on all of this fuel. And then when the fuel got to the top of the main jet here, it hit the air and then atomized the fuel, what we call atomized. It mixed the air with the fuel and made it so it was more ignitable when it actually gets inside the engine. And if you notice there, I've illustrated this fuel coming out here as smaller particles than this fuel and there's a good reason for that because this is the high pressure area that air has hit that fuel so hard that it's really put that fuel into tiny little molecules if you like whereas this one this one was injected in and it was lying at the bottom there on the inlet and the air just came through and simply picked it up and took it into the engine so the reason we initially inject this fuel is to get in the engine first and initially help start the engine and then when the engine started it's this fuel that keeps the engine running and I know I've already mentioned this but I just wanted to be clear on the distinction between the two and so we've established that we've got that vacuum there and of course that vacuum has pulled the diaphragm up and of course Pulling the diaphragm up means that it's drawn some fuel up beneath it and because the piston's still lowering on the induction stroke it's pulling all that air and fuel in towards the engine. And if you notice there this butterfly is still closed so we might wonder why air and fuel would get through past here and go into the engine. Well this butterfly won't open until the engine's took hold and is running quite fast. So the air and fuel at the moment escapes round the sides of this butterfly because it doesn't shut completely closed, it just slightly open and also there's a little hole here on the right hand side. Air can also go through there so the air and fuel mixture that is goes alongside it and through that little hole and that's enough to get the engine initially started. But let's remember this is still only one stroke of the piston so the piston's still only coming down this is just a breakdown of all that's happening whilst it does. So if we look here we've got fuel coming out of this main jet and that fuel of course is supplied by the reservoir here at the bottom and that reservoir of course is emptying as that fuel is leaving for the engine and the fuel is being drawn out of here accelerated out if you like by two means of course this way here where we've got the main jet we've got the air rushing past the top drawing that fuel out but at the same time we've got this channel here now this channel comes out to the inlet area there and what happens is that as the air comes through it enters that channel there and travels down through it and because this channel is directly connected to the main jet and the fact that there's already a vacuum coming out there so there's already suction coming up and the fact that this air coming down here is under pressure as well because of the force of the air coming inwards when that air actually meets the fuel here it mixes with the fuel and maintains a flow through and out through the jet there in that direction and so a combination between a vacuum pulling the fuel out the main jet there caused by the air and also the pressure of the air coming in this tube here and pushing out the fuel means that there's plenty of vacuum strength there to pull up that fuel and ensure that there's enough fuel in this carburetor for the engine. So in short both these mechanisms work together and again let's remember that this is all happening on the induction stroke so let's imagine now we're at the end of the induction stroke and we're going back up now so this is now the compression stroke and let's have a look at the differences here well of course the obvious difference is that the pistons now going up and there's no drawing in of air and fuel so we haven't got that here and because there's no air coming in there's no vacuum drawing any fuel up from here and of course because there's no inlet vacuum at all we've got the diaphragm here that's been allowed to lower under its own spring pressure and that diaphragm coming down has created that pressure there for the fuel to come this way through the one-way valve there the little valve flap and then round and then to fill this little reservoir again here and that's now replenished 
the stores of the fuel in that reservoir there ready to be used again in the inlet when it's needed. Any excess that goes into here, remember, is let out through this little hole here and it falls back down to the rest of the fuel in the tank. So now we know what's going on here on the compression stroke. There's actually no pickup of fuel at all because the pickup pipe here has no vacuum in there. There's nothing being drawn upwards and there's no air being drawn in in the inlet. And so let's have a look at the next stroke then, which is the power stroke. So the piston's been forced back down now after combustion has occurred. And if we look now at the actual carburetor, not a lot's changed. As far as things go, there's no vacuum in there because it's not the induction stroke and things haven't changed yet. OK then, so let's imagine power stroke has taken place and now we're going into exhaust stroke. So the piston's coming back up now and forcing all the exhaust fumes out inside the engine. Let's take a look at what's happening now inside the carburetor. Absolutely no difference whatsoever yet. But now the exhaust stroke's over and we're back on the induction stroke again. Here we are. We've got all the functionings occurring as I've explained before. We've got air coming into all of these places, making everything happen. We've got all the vacuum back and we've got the fuel coming in from the reservoirs. Everything's functioning naturally then as it should do on the induction stroke. And then as we cycle through the other strokes, we see nothing and then we've got the induction stroke back again. And as the engine starts to run then and build up momentum, this butterfly opens, as I said earlier. Until now, it's been letting a mediocre amount of air and fuel through there. But because there's been a lower amount of air going through there, the ratio between air and fuel has been slightly different. There's been a slightly more ratio of fuel to air. And that's helped so far in getting the engine going from a cold start. But now, of course, that the engine's going OK and it's starting to warm up, we don't need that extra amount of fuel there compared to air. So that's opened up now and allowed the right mixture of the two to get to the engine for efficient running when the engine's warmer. So if this butterfly was open too soon then, when the engine was still cold, it would affect the starting of the engine and the performance of the engine when it's cold. But if it opened too late, then it would start to put in too much fuel into a warm engine and that would choke the engine. Now remember this fuel vein here, some fuel does actually seep out of here when the engine's running. This is normally just to inject starting fuel in here, but when the engine's running, as I say, some fuel does actually come out of here. And that's because the vacuum coming up the pickup pipe here and goes this way and then it sucks some of that fuel out from behind the back of the primer bulb. And again, anybody who's ever had one of these primer bulbs damaged where they're leaking knows that the engine does not run right because it draws in air there into the primer bulb and that ends up in the inlet of the carburetor which puts the inner workings in there at too much air to fuel ratio and that will not allow the engine to run correctly. OK, so that about explains it. But what I really want to do now is let the animation run so we can see before our eyes what's going on there. I really hope that's helped you gather an understanding of how these carburetors work. I do realise I've repeated myself quite a bit in there, but that's just the way I do things in order to help get the point across. One thing I will advise you now, after watching that particular video, I can't stress enough how important it is to make sure that these diaphragms are changed regularly. They will show problems regularly and they will need changing regularly. So with every service, please get them done. That's if they don't need them in between. Sometimes they do. But overall, in my opinion, I think these engines are brilliant. They start well. They're easy to diagnose and repair if there's any issues. Generally, it's only the diaphragms that show fault. And other than that, fantastic. OK, I want to thank you so much for watching and I'll be back soon.